Good morning, Brizzy, and welcome to News Lounge for this gorgeous Thursday morning. I'm Tom Hartley. And I'm Catherine Tucker. Good morning. I'll be filling in for Maritza today, so thank you for having me. It's nice to have you here, Catherine. Yeah, it's great. I love being in everyone's lounge room this morning. Nice and creepy-like. <laughs> and we're going to head over to uh, say hello to Monica this morning. How are you doing? G'day, guys. We've got a massive day in the sports world today, so get excited for that later in the show. Looking forward to that one. That sounds fantastic. But for now, we're going to head over to Tony, our resident newsman, for the news. All right, guys, strap yourselves in. Making news today on Thursday 13th of December 2012. Police investigations continue to unravel the death and the cause of Sultan Al Alamri's death, whose body was found beyond the bush, beyond recognition. The man died in the seventh, on the 17th of October, and police now believe his death may be linked to feuding drug syndicates. Yesterday, police and forensic officers arrived at a Paradise Island home suspected to be linked However, none of the residents were arrested and police continue their search. Federal Court Judge Stephen Rez dismissed a sexual harassment case brought against former parliamentary speaker Peter Slipper yesterday. According to Judge Rez, the case was a political attack against Slipper by staffer James Hunter Ashby. However, Mr Ashby's lawyers have rejected a judge's criticism that politics played a part in the conduct of the client's sexual harassment case against Mr. Slipper. Slipper is pleased with the outcome and says the past eight months have been extremely traumatic for his family. As the doctor death trial continues, new information regarding the death of a 75-year-old patient who died under Jane Patel's care has arisen. Prosecutors told the Brisbane Supreme Court yesterday that the former Bundaberg surgeon performed a surgery on a medically unfit patient, Mervyn Morris, after incorrectly diagnosing him as having diverticultus. Lawyers for Patel are expected to submit the manslaughter charge against their client to be permanently stayed. Just hours after being released on bail, Embassy leader Wayne Coco Wharton yesterday addressed supporters of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in Musgrave Park about the future of the site. After a number of arrests at the site on Tuesday night, Mr Wharton called for the resignation of Lord Mayor Quirk, saying he failed to show up at an organised community meeting over a week ago, which would have showed the support the Embassy has from the community. Mr. Wharton says that the closure of the embassy has caused irreparable damage between the community and Brisbane's police, fire brigade and council members. Besieged, Sydney radio station Two Day FM could be forced to break its silence over the royal prank call, with the media watchdog confirming it will investigate the scandal. The station could lose its right to broadcast if it is found by the Australian Communications and Media Authority to have breached a licence condition. It may also be subject to tighter restrictions and a hefty fine. According to Queensland Health, patients in line for a non-urgent surgery at four hospitals in Queensland's southeast may have had their theatre time cancelled until next year due to federal government's funding changes. CEO of the Metro South Health region, Dr Richard Ashby, has confirmed Category 3 surgery at QE2 Princess Alexandra, Logan and, Rich and Redlands hospitals will be deferred and more than 50 nursing jobs will be cut from QE2 Hospital. We will be deferring non-urgent surgery. Obviously our core services, patients in emergency departments, cancer care, maternity and so on will be continuing exactly as it is, says Mr Ashby. Ray Robertson, former Queensland ATSIC Commissioner, is seeking leave to appeal in the High Court over dishonesty convictions. This comes after Robertson lost his bid last month in the Court of Appeal to overturn two convictions for dishonest use of his position by selling cars owned by Indigenous organisations to pay his legal bills. All you workers out there may know December is statistically regarded as one of the most unproductive months of the year. Australian Institute of Management, Queensland and Northern Territory Chief Executive Vivian Anton claims managers struggle every year to keep their staff motivated in the weeks leading up to Christmas as they are constantly procrastinating about the holidays. Miss Anton cites goal objectives, flexible arrangements, no emailing and being productive with co-workers to be the main steps for overcoming inefficiency in the workplace during December. According to the RSPCA, one in three puppies are put down as a result of oversupply to pet stores during the Christmas season. RSPCA Media and Campaigns Manager Jennifer Salter said, many Salters have already been inundated with unwanted cats, 
dogs and rabbits and urge people wanting to buy a pet to adopt one through the RSPCA rather than buying from a pet store. The RSPCA urge all Christmas shoppers never to give pets as presents and to remember that animals such as cats can live up to 20 years and require a solid commitment. Australian and Queensland school children are lagging behind in the education race, according to the Process and in International Reading Literacy Study. The study found 40% of Queensland students aren't reaching the intermediate level in maths by year 8. More than a third of Queensland Year 4 students were not meeting science benchmarks and a quarter failed to meet the minimum standard in reading for their age. Australia ranked 27th out of 48 countries in reading. The Queensland Teachers Union says more funding is needed if the state's education results are to improve. Some exciting news for Brisbane art lovers as the Asia Pacific Terennial of Contemporary Art opened this week at the Gallery of Modern Art at the Queensland Art Gallery. The show features new and recent works by 75 seniors and emerging artists and groups from 27 countries across the region. Administration is free and the exhibition will run until the 14th of April. That's it for the news. Back to you, Tom Cat. Thanks, Tone Dog. We're going to head straight over to Monica now for the sports. Sorry, the weather. The weather. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Well, it looks like the rain may finally be clearing in Brisbane with only a few showers here and there. Temperatures will remain in the high 20s this week. Today, Brisbane's in for a mostly sunny day with a few morning showers and some moderate to fresh southeasterly winds. We can expect a top of 27 degrees in the city and 26 for Bayside. Once again, showers continue to persist in major southeast Queensland cities, with the Gold Coast reaching a top of 26, the Sunshine Coast with a top of 27 and Ipswich with a top of 29. Around the state now, Cairns can expect a shower or two with a top of 32. Townsville is mostly fine and sunny with a brief shower and 33 degrees. Mackay has a shower and or two and 31 degrees. Rockhampton mostly fine with a possible shower and 32 degrees. A fine and partly cloudy day for Mount Isa with a warm top of 40 degrees. And in other capital cities around the country, Sydney will mostly sunny with a top of 26. Melbourne a possible shower, late shower in the afternoon and a warm top of 35 degrees. Canberra now sunny with a max of 30. Hobart with an afternoon shower or two and a top of 29. Adelaide's in for some possible showers and 38 degrees. Heavy showers and storms for Perth and a max of 25. And Darwin will get an afternoon shower or storm and a top of 34 degrees. That's all for the weather today. Back to you guys. Thanks, Thanks very everyone. much, Monica. Isn't that interesting that we start to slack off around Christmas instead of putting in that, you know, that extra hard work to get yeah, us over the line there? It is, it is a long year usually for a lot of workers, you know, and they really look forward to their Christy break, but I guess they've got to just keep going for those last hard yards in, in December. Definitely. I don't, yeah. don't think I've seen you slack off around the office yet. No, I've been working very hard, but very much looking forward to my holiday uh, coming up. What about you? Absolutely. About the same, really, Catherine. Oh, what about you, Monica? Oh, yeah, looking forward to working, making a bit of dosh. <laughs> you know how it is. It is an expensive time of the year, Christmas. I haven't even thought about my shopping yet. I don't know about you guys, but it, you know, I've always um, dreaded this time of the year. Yes, it is going to be very, very crazy out at the shop, so everyone make sure you are keeping safe. After the break, we'll be back with Jason Waters with his development program for Autistic Kids Don't Go Away. Welcome back to News Lounge. Every day our brains interpret the things we see, hear, feel, touch, interact with and experience. But when someone's brain is having trouble comprehending these things, it can often be hard to talk, learn, play and share emotions. Yes, many children with autism spectrum disorder have trouble understanding what emotions look like and understanding what other people are thinking. Some of the things that they do may seem unusual and it can be hard for other people to understand what they're doing. Exactly right. Imagine a world that you're trying to understand and you're trying to express your feelings too, but you find it difficult to do these things. That's what life can be like for people who have autism. Mm, definitely. And today we're joined by Jason Waters from Brick Kids, the business behind Awesome Fitness. Welcome, Jason. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. It's fantastic to have you. So I believe you have history um, as a teacher. So how did you um, transition from that link of, of being a primary school PE teacher to, to developing this program? Yeah, um, I've been teaching for about 10 years and have worked with a lot of autistic kids in mainstream schooling um, and find them so rewarding and they've got so much potential. 
they do find it really hard in a school setting and schools do a really good job, especially in the special needs area. And I've created a program um, basing um, or focusing on physical fitness and all the aspects of, of sport for these children. And we work through on a slow basis, working with them to be able to achieve to their full potential. So this program um, is called Awesome Fitness. How does it exactly work? Okay, the children come to us in their first season. It, it goes for 10 seasons, so a couple of years. By the end of those 10 seasons, a lot of these children are ready to play mainstream sport. We equip them with all the skills, uh, the understanding of the game. We go through on a rotational basis with our activities. Um, and each term, the, ki the children come and, and it's a, a six, six uh, session per, per term and, and the kids just achieve amazing results in that time. Yeah, and I understand it is actually quite a, a unique program. There, there aren't many out there like that. What, what does make this program so unique? Uh, like I stated, we work with the kids to reach their full potential, show the patience and understanding, um, and once they grasp the skills, they really surprise themselves too. Um, so just really working with them on a step-by-step -step process, um, showing the understanding and giving them the environment to reach their full potential, um, because there's a lot of variables in mainstream schooling that make it hard for these guys. So we try and eliminate those so that they can get the best out of what they're doing. And what are, just what are some of those processes? I remember you mentioning before you start off with them one-on-one -on -one and then you move them to groups. How does that really help children with autism? Definitely. Well, with our, our, our season, um, it's, it's up in Mackay at the moment and we've got 20 children that are enrolled up there. I have a one hour session one on one with them for the first three weeks and every child goes through the same aspects, the same sports and skills and they use the same rotational prompts. So when we come together as a group, the children are all expecting the same thing and it works harmoniously. Oh, that's excellent. What are some of the results you've seen in the kids so far? Definitely. Um, with, like I said, mainstream schooling, the PE envir environment especially can be very overwhelming for these children. So um, the results, w when they come to me, at first stage, um, they're very. A lot of them are downtrodden with their experiences with sport at school, um, and haven't got a lot of belief in themselves. Once they get even halfway through a season, they are just so excited and eager to come because they feel that the success um, that they can achieve. And how have, how have these children's parents reacted so far? Uh, we've had amazing support, and the the parents have been overwhelmed to see their children, and to see the success that their kids can have and the skills that they've got, giving them the opportunity to utilise those skills. So are they seeing these results come after, I guess, their parents with um, autistic children may, and may find it very overwhelming to see such amazing results? Definitely, definitely. And um, for the children also, yeah, just for the parents to see the looks on the, on the children's face that they are achieving and, and yeah, it's... It builds a sense of community too, and these children have ownership. Oh, it's, it's their own sporting group is the best way to explain it. And um, after their first season, uh, the children get a jersey, um, so they come. And then we, eventually, after five seasons, we get together. The kids are all adapted with uh, and equipped with the same skills, knowledge of all the games, and then we start playing games pretty much the same as like you'd have for Saturday morning sport. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned the sense of community. Is is there a big sense of community within this within this program between the children and the parents? Most definitely, most definitely. Um, it, it's like I said, it, it's something that they can have ownership on and it's something that they enjoy and it's a positive environment that that everyone loves. So uh, after about 5 ter five terms or 5 seasons, once we have this Saturday sporting environment, it's a really positive feel and, and everyone just enjoys it. And is it good for the parents as well to be able to, to share stories and, and talk to other parents who maybe experience similar things with, you know, all the parents obviously having autistic Most definitely. Children? It's a great outlet for them and, and to come and experience the positivity of it. I've got lots of parents that do get involved with their children too, so they really enjoy that experience. Uh, when it's facilitated well, that just for them to have a harmonious time together is... is I get so much out of it, it's great. And could you share with us um, one big success story or any particular ones you there's can think There's plenty, of? there's plenty. Um, they're all amazing children and they're all success stories in their own right. Um, a little boy came to me um, eight weeks ago and hadn't played any sport. He's PE at school. He just used to run out of the school ground, um, didn't want to touch a football, didn't want to touch a soccer ball. Um, after six weeks of the season, he's doing amazing things. He's kicking footballs, soccer balls, um, playing cricket, 
he's gone through uh, 25 sports in the six weeks and just really excited to get his jersey and get into next year. So it was a big turnaround for him and, and obviously overwhelming for his parents. So yeah, I guess to see a, such a, a dramatic change around would be just an incredible thing to witness in such a short period of time. So it sounds like you're having tremendous luck with, or well not luck, as you've created your own luck with this program and I think it's sounds excellent. Yeah, it's an absolutely fantastic program. So what's the next step from here? I know it's uh, up, only up in Mackay at the moment. Yeah, so we've established ourselves in Mackay in central Queensland um, and we're going to bring the program to Brisbane next year. So uh, early 2013 we'll, we'll start doing advertising and, and things down here. Already um, we've got a big response from, from down in Brisbane people that are really interested. So we're so excited to, to bring the program to Brisbane and, and kick it off. What's the demand for something like this? You know, we say it's, it's the first program of its kind in a Australia. What's the demand for that down here? Um, obviously um, a, a lot of people live in Brisbane so th there's more autistic children and and um, Asperger's and children. for autistic children? Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all of the like. So obviously there, there's a high demand here and um, yeah we're just really looking forward to, to bringing it here and and everyone to experience it. Fantastic. So, and so for any of those parents that are in Brisbane and, and want to get more info about it or want to find out how they can get involved um, when the program does start down here, how can they do that? What's the best way for them to uh, There'll be information on the website, so www.brickskids.com um, and all the information will be there. There's registration forms and everything, so uh, all the information's there and there's contact details on the website too for other uh, forms of meeting. Fantastic. Sounds Fantastic. really, really great. That's so good. Thank you so much for your time, Jason. It's been an absolute, absolutely sensational having you here. It's excellent insight. Great program. Mm. I think everyone would be definitely interested in getting behind this. Um, we'll post some links on our Facebook to that one. Yes, yeah, so we'll definitely you keep you up to date with that one because it is a fantastic program and it is very, very unique, one of the first of its kind um, for yep. those students with learning difficulties. So excellent. that's a fantastic one. Uh, get behind that. We'll see you after the break for some more sports and Amber Dermody will be back with her guest. Welcome back to News Lounge. Well, it is Thursday today, which means we are joined by Amber Dermody for our regular tech segment. And today she has a guest with her, Louisa Dahl from Integrated uh, Minds. So welcome to both of you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Um, so it's actually Interactive Minds. Oh, sorry, Interactive Minds, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but for anybody who hasn't actually heard of Interactive Minds, um, it's a monthly networking event specialising in internet and, and online marketing um, techniques and tools and, and tricks of the trade. Um, in fact, a guest from a guest of mine from a couple of weeks ago, Sam Zivit, has been a speaker there. Um, and uh, as well as uh, many other big names in the digital and, and online community as large. Um, Louisa, firstly, can you tell us a little bit more about Interactive Minds and, and why you actually decided to start it? Sure. Well, as you mentioned, Interactive Minds runs monthly events for the digital marketing professionals in Brisbane. Um, I was working in digital marketing for about 10 years and kind of came to a point in my career where I was looking for opportunities. and. Together with an ex-colleague of mine, we identified there was an opportunity for us to hold regular networking and educational events for the Brisbane digital community. So we started off back in 2008 holding monthly events and bringing together industry speakers who could share some knowledge and expertise with our audience. Fantastic. So when you guys started up, were there any kind of competitors or, or who was around in that space at the time? There wasn't really any direct competitors in the digital marketing space. There were a couple of marketing events, um, such as Networks, which runs great monthly events. Um, however, these were only covering digital topics occasionally, so we saw an opportunity to hold events that were just about digital marketing. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and so what has actually been your favourite event this year and, and who's been your favourite speaker? And tell us a little bit about it. Might be hard to identify. It's very hard to pick one. a favourite, given <laughs> yeah. that I do come up with all the topics and speakers. However, our last event, which was in November, was a, a great one. Um, we had a digital marketing campaign showcase, so we had a number of speakers come along, including Ahmed from Bupa, um, Brendan from oh. Sign Up Two, who I think you know, um, and also Kirsty from What If was speaking as well. So each of these people went and showed an example of a recent digital marketing campaign, and we're able to share some knowledge and learnings around it, which is really interesting. 
Oh, fantastic. Okay, so what guests do you usually have attending and and um, and what fields? Are they generally just digital marketers or are they from various fields? Yeah, we do have a range of digital marketing people attend. Um, and we also have small business owners, entrepreneurs and agencies as well who come and, and network and attend our events. So quite a range of people from a different sectors of um, the community and businesses. Oh, fantastic. And for anybody that's looking to set up a networking group or, or monthly events, sort of uh, as you have done um, for corporates or entrepreneurs or, or marketing professionals in general, can you give us or can you give them any tips or advice? Sure. I think the most valuable thing to us when we started was having a good network initially. So being able to network with both speakers and people who might attend and having people that we could call on, um, as well as good relationships with companies who being on to become our sponsors. So that was really valuable for us in the first instance. And also then, um, I suppose, getting some support. So a few years in, I did get involved with some event managers who have been able to help us to run the events and get through the day-to-day -day elements of the events as well. Oh, fantastic. Okay, and so have you got any special guests or topics lined up for next year? We are in the process of, of defining our events at the moment. Our first one will be in February. Um, we have got the topic on that, which will be focusing your digital marketing for 2013, but we are still finding our speakers and finalising those at the moment. Oh, how exciting. Um, so I guess taking off on that um, answer, um, in your opinion and being in the online space yourself, what are some of the digital trends that people should be you know, looking out for and practising in, in 2013? Well, we did actually have an event on this in, in October, so I'll borrow some of the content from that a little bit. Um, the trends that I see as being important are um, mobile, obviously there's been a focus on mobile sites and being able to, to provide content for mobile users whether that be on phones or iPads or other devices so that's going to continue being big for the year and also being able to have responsive designs so that you design one site which will appear nicely across different devices. Um, as well as that, I think big data is something that's being talked about quite a lot um, and that would be, I suppose, people being able to leverage data and information from a lot of their different sources, whether it be their website, their customer history or their CRM um, and bringing that together to make informed marketing decisions. Absolutely, big data's been around for a little while. It's still confusing some people, but I think it's finally starting to, yeah, to get through. Yeah, that's right. A lot yeah. of the time, it's one step at a time for <laughs> companies to make it happen for them. So um, a lot of our guests today wouldn't actually know, but um, Louisa is now pregnant with her third child. And, and each time that you get pregnant, you actually start up a new business. Yes, so yes. have you got any more plans? <laughs> Well, no, third time in, I'm trying to be really good and hold myself back, but um, I have decided to to expand a little bit on Interactive Minds for the coming year, which is really exciting. So as well as our monthly events that we're holding, I'm also going to be doing a one-day conference next year. So it'll be the first digital marketing conference of its, of its nature that's in Brisbane um, and a full day, full day conference. So looking to get forward to doing that in August. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'll definitely be in attendance. And just quickly to finish off, can you tell us your favourite app, perhaps business and a personal one? Sure. Very hard to pick a favourite, but for business, I really like using TurboScan. It's an app on my iPhone that I can scan documents with, take photos of and save as PDFs um, and email them off. So I find that really handy and a good alternative to faxes and scanners. Um, and personal, really hard one. Um, obviously, Facebook's a bit of a favourite, but I'll, I'll be a bit more professional and say I like using Zinio to read marketing magazines and things like that on my phone. Zinio. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this is actually my last segment for the year. Um, so thank you all for having me and, and thank you, Louisa, for coming in. Thank you. Appreciate thank the opportunity. You. Thanks, guys. Thanks for that. That was a great little interview there, Amber. Awesome. We're going to throw it straight over to Monica now for the sports. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Melbourne Stars player Lassith Malinga has made cricket history after playing the best 2020 bowling figure in Australia against Perth Scorchers. After taking a wicket in each of his four overs, Malinga bowled an outstanding 20 dot balls in six wickets for just seven runs. The Scorchers were out for 69 in 15.2 overs, taking the crown for the lowest team total in Australian T20 history. Stars captain Shane Warne said the team was out for revenge after the Scorchers eliminated them in the last season's semi-finals. In, in the NRL now, the 2013 salary cap is set to rise as much as $5.8 million with hopes to prevent the NRL and several clubs losing star players. Following collective bargaining agreement talks at League Central, NRL officials have delivered a formula which will meet the players' pay demands. Wayne Bennett and Darren Lockyer were present, recommending rule changes for next season. 
However, all eyes were on players Robbie Farah, Paul Gallen and Clint Newton, representing their peers in the fight for better conditions in the NRL. In the A-League, Raw captain Matt Smith is asking his side to watch about what they say about the former coach Angie Postagologu as they prepare to face the Melbourne victory this Saturday. However, keeping the flary striker Bazart Barisha quiet may not be as easy task as they thought, vowing to send the former Raw current victory coach home a loser. That's all for sport today, guys. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for that, Monica. It was only a short wrap today, but it has been a very tight show. It's been absolutely sensational to have some great guests in today. But we'll see you about this time tomorrow for some more. Yeah, we've got some fantastic Christmas specials on tomorrow, so a bit of fun tomorrow. Um, and we would like to thank both of our guests, Jason, Louisa, and, of course, Amber, for her great tech segment today. And thank you very much for having me today. Maritz will be back with you tomorrow. It's been a pleasure having you here today, it's Catherine. Been absolutely wonderful. We hope everyone out there in Brisbane has a fantastic day in the sunshine, and we'll see you tomorrow. See you guys. <laughs>